the Strait Satans were based out of two regions, San Fernando Valley and Venice, with the bottom rocker patch on their vest signaling their chapter geography. Their main clubhouse was in Venice Beach, and it was the roof of their building where Doors frontman Jim Morrison often stayed to visit two girlfriends. On weekends, members headed to Lake Isabella for parties. They rode, drank, and roughhoused with each other and sometimes with rivals. Club dues financed their parties, along with covering fees to bail bondsmen and traffic lawyers. Being a biker in the 60s meant you were a target for every traffic ticket quota. The Straight Satans had a den mother of sorts, Mother Ruth. She was well-loved, a combination of Joan Blondell and Annie Oakley. Ruth married at least seven times and was a figurehead for the Straight Satans until her 1966 arrest for check fraud. Many of the photos of club members found in recent years came from her personal collection. Despite the parties and reputation, most bikers were not chronic drug users. Motorcycles just aren't that forgiving. And many of the club members had full-time jobs as skilled laborers in the building trades or as auto mechanics. Al Springer, AKA Guardrail, for instance, was a machinist and contrary to the general image of bikers in that era, also a family man. Several of the club members were veterans discombobulated by their Vietnam experience. The U.S. Army sold thousands of cheap military model Harley and Indian bikes at auction, and riding became an easy pastime for ex-servicemen, especially with the hot rod culture in full swing. Compared to a car, even a junkyard car at around $250 with parts, a $15 bike was easily more affordable. In today's world, you'll find motorcycle enthusiasts and even regional club members who have no idea what it means to be a one percenter. As the saying goes, 99% of motorcyclists are law-abiding citizens, and then there's the other 1%. Those days of hell on wheels are mostly in the past. Today, doctors, lawyers, and CEOs number among the smaller clubs, which are simply opportunities for friends to ride together. If you see someone looking flashy on a motorcycle, it's unlikely that they're the real deal these days. The true one percenter is now hidden among the rest of the two-wheeled society. But in the 1950s and 60s, being in a motorcycle club meant a true ride-or-die mentality. Both the Straight Satans and Satan's Slaves, another 1% club, figure in the story of the Manson family. Charlie cozied up to the Straight Satans and may have had dealings with the Satan's Slaves as well. The Satan's Slaves, also based in the Venice area, had among their ranks a man named Joe Dorgan. Dorgan, a known drug dealer and felon, was engaged in 1969 to a woman named Suzanne LaBerge. Suzanne was the daughter of Manson family victim Rosemary LaBianca. Manson himself claimed that he rode with Joe Dorgan, but Dorgan denied the connection. Charlie saw the unity and strength in the straight Satans, and he wondered if he could use them to his advantage. He wanted to control who came onto ranch property, as well as thinking ahead to the muscle he would need when Helter Skelter came down. The family would need protection to escape the coming Armageddon and flee into the desert. Charlie didn't love the alcohol use that went on in straight Satan circles, and he really didn't like the use of speed or methamphetamines, which were a primary revenue source for the bikers in the late 60s. But he couldn't deny their might, their knowledge of guns, and their willingness to defend the family. It ultimately meant turning a lot of his women over to the club, but it was worth it to have their power behind him. He thought the straight Satans would be an army for us, Gypsy explained. He used the girls to attract them. Straight Satan treasurer Danny DiCarlo was handy with cars, helping to repair some of the junkers the family drove. He helped Manson fix a trike, then converted a couple cars into dune buggies. The girls, who nicknamed him Donkey Dan, adored him. Lynn wrote that Ruth and Leslie were probably most interested in motorcycle mechanics 
They knew if Danny had a knucklehead, a shovelhead, or a panhead motor, and that he was so particular about his bike he wouldn't let anyone else touch it. After some weeks as onlookers, though, they were given the honor of polishing parts. Danny was especially enamored of Ruth Ann, later commenting to detectives how disappointed he was when he heard her muse about the day she might kill her first pig. Daniel Danny DiCarlo was born June 1944 in Toronto. He earned his U.S. citizenship after serving four years in the Coast Guard. When he met Manson, Danny was going through a divorce. His ex was a benzedrine addict, and Danny was raising their son, Dennis. The ranch was the perfect place to hang out with guys he had something in common with and girls that were more than willing to make themselves available to him. That included babysitting Dennis, who joined Pooh Bear, Zizo, and John Partee's son at the ranch. DiCarlo was a ladies' man, and Spawn Ranch appealed to him for that reason. But there was something else that interested him as well. Weapons. Danny was a gun collector, and his father was a licensed weapons dealer. While hanging at Spawn Ranch, Danny worked on an old Thompson submachine gun, sometimes known as a grease gun. Danny was always closer to Bobby and Tex than to Manson, but Charlie fawned over the straight Satans. That spring, he paid several outstanding traffic tickets for SS member George Knoll. As a thank you, the club loaned Charlie their prized cutlass sword, a signature possession of the club. Manson thought it was a gift, but it was not intended to linger far from the straight Satan's Venice clubhouse for long. With the exception of DiCarlo, the other straight Satans weren't fans of Charlie. Many enjoyed the girls, but they were concerned about the depth to which Danny got sucked into the family. Once, several bikers rode onto the ranch and threatened to rape and kill everyone if Danny weren't released to them. Charlie gave them his usual ultimatum. Kill me, man. Charlie would get down on his knees and offer his enemies a knife or gun and dare them to kill him. His sacrificial lamb act struck the wrong nerve with the straight Satans, who fled Spawn Ranch and remained suspicious about Manson's motives. Charlie pictured the straight Satans as his army, eventually marching with the family to their crystal cavern in the desert. To curry favor with them sometimes meant turning a blind eye to their cozying up to his women. But he seethed with the implied rejection. Leslie recalled that once she left with a biker, and it was in Redondo Beach, and it had been friendly, and Manson came and got me, and he made it real clear to this man that there would be problems, you know, unless I went with him. And I did. I went back. I learned early that there was consequence for all action in that relationship. On March 21st, a gun was stolen from archery headquarters at the LAPD in El Monte. A man named Ron was the alleged thief, but he sold that .22 caliber Longhorn to Randy Starr of Spawn Ranch. Starr later traded that gun to Manson, and it wound up in Tex Watson's hands on the night of August 9th. On March 23rd, the day Manson visited Cielo Drive, he returned in a foul mood. Around 5.30 that evening, a 17-year-old girl from Reseda, identified later as C. Smith, was picked up hitchhiking by two young men. They told her they lived on an old Western film set in Chatsworth and asked if she'd like to hang out with them. She agreed and was driven to Spawn Ranch. That evening, she later told police, Charlie raped her. Terrified, she asked someone to give her a ride to buy cigarettes. Once at the store, she escaped. A couple weeks later, she went to the cops. Also on March 23rd, Bobby Beausoleil signed a songwriting contract with the Girard Agency near the Whiskey Agogo. Bobby was living with Dennis Wilson and Greg Jacobson on North Beverly Glen and dating Catherine Kitty Ludesinger, who grew up on a horse ranch north of L.A., Kitty was a strawberry blonde with lots of freckles and a tanned Malibu Barbie spunkiness. She was introduced to Bobby through Jacobson. On March 24th, Danny DiCarlo's estranged wife Miriam showed up at Spawn Ranch. As explained earlier, Miriam was a pillhead, and Danny was keeping their 10-month-old son, Dennis. 
It was 11 p.m. when she arrived at Spawn looking for Danny and Dennis. She barged into one of the larger buildings and encountered almost two dozen people, including her ex-husband. She demanded that he return her son to her or she would take him to court. From the time she hit the door, she never stopped moving, jumping on tables and throwing anything she could grab. Danny shouted, I swear to God I'll kill you if you don't get down and they tangled, she digging into his face and drawing blood with her nails, he pulling her long black hair until she was a crazy mess on the floor. Danny then brutally kicked his ex-wife with steel-toed engineer boots. Manson joined the action, grabbing Miriam by her hair and dragging her into another room. She managed to flee and drove to the Devonshire police station, seven miles east of the ranch, where she filed charges against both men. Miriam warned police that her ex-husband was a member of the straight Satans and she feared he would kill her. The police investigated and on the morning of March 30th arrested Manson and DiCarlo. They were charged with assault with intent to do bodily harm, but it doesn't appear the charges went any further than that. Charlie is participating in serious, even violent crimes and associating with known criminals but law enforcement didn't think this guy's parole needed to be revoked. By the way, Charlie's booking papers for this arrest listed his height as five foot seven inches, but that number was false. It was based on the height listed on his driver's license, issued in 1967. Charlie was only five two or five three at his tallest. Police records therefore relied upon what he had personally and falsely listed on his ID until his November 1969 arrest for murder. Then, they made sure to show the public a photograph of him standing beside a measuring stick, the diminutive little man with such persuasive power over others.